All right, let's open up in your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 5. As we continue our study here through the book of Deuteronomy, we're in this series called Refresh, and we're in the middle now of the retelling of the Ten Commandments, the, the Big Ten. So we saw this initially in Exodus chapter 20, and we took some time to go through it, and now we're back here in the book of Deuteronomy. How many were with us when we did this in Exodus chapter 20. Let me see a raise of hands here in the chapel. So a few of you, so for some of you, you're like, yeah, we heard this like 20 years ago when we were in the book of Exodus. For the rest of you, you're hearing this for the first time, and the beauty of the retelling of this law was that for many of the people who are hearing this at the book of Deuteronomy right on the edge of the promised land, they had heard it when they were younger, but there has been a 40-year period that have elapsed since they heard these things. And no doubt they would talk about it as they went, but they're getting a refresher course because Moses is telling them, in effect, look, I'm not going to be with you in the promised land, and I want to make sure that you understand who the Lord is and what he's up to. And so over the last couple of messages, I've gone through a whole whopping three of the Big Ten. So we're going to pick up in verse 12 at the command about the Sabbath day. So look what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 12. It says, observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath. So, the fourth commandment, remember I made this statement previously that the first two tablets of the command focus on our relationship with God and then the second part or the second tablet of the law or of the Ten Commandments focuses on our relationship with other people, right? And in a lot of ways, the concept of the Sabbath day is actually almost a fulcrum between the two. Because the idea of the Sabbath day, now it doesn't only go back to the book of Exodus and God's deliverance of the children of Israel from Egypt. It also goes all the way back to the creation account of Genesis 1 and the beginning of Genesis 2. Remember on the seventh day of creation, you read about it in Genesis chapter 2. It says that, and God rested from his labor on the seventh day. And so in the creation narrative, we get the idea that God rested on the seventh day, and then we get it instituted into the life and the fabric of the community of God, the children of Israel, that they should rest for a day every single week. Now, you might say, well, why did God rest in the seven days of creation? And I always say the same thing. God didn't rest because God was like totally pooped after creating everything. You know, you have that idea, it's like all of a sudden God, he's been speaking the universe into existence, and he made all these animals, he did all this stuff, and then all of a sudden God's like, man, it's hard work being God and creating everything, and so I'm just really tired, I need like a spa day. You know what I mean? It's not that, because God is all-powerful, right? But you have to think, what did God create on the sixth day of creation? He created mankind. And what's the very first thing mankind is meant to experience? Rest. Why? Because mankind needed to learn right from the beginning, it's not by works. That's what mankind needs. So the very first thing that Adam and Eve experienced was a day of rest, where they didn't have any customary labor. Why? Because it's telling Adam and Eve, the first human beings, the gospel, that it's not about your works, it's about God's work for you. Now, you fast forward into the life of the children of Israel and our lives, the greatest thing that you and I struggle with is the fact that you feel and I feel that everything in our life is dependent on us. And guess what? My friends, that is functional atheism. If you believe that everything in your life depends solely on what you do, then what you're saying is that there is no God. And so God knew that we would be there. God knew that 
in the heart of hearts of every human being that we would struggle to trust. I was reminded of something that I love to say just before when we were doing our meet and greet. That the, What's the problem with walking by faith? You got to walk by faith. That's the problem with it. We'd rather walk by sight. It's easier to walk by what we know as opposed to walk trusting what God might or may not do. And so God knows that we're like that. God knows that we struggle. And so God wanted to make sure that we never believe that everything in our life is dependent upon us. So he instituted the Sabbath day. That every single week there needs to be a day that is taken and that day is not to work the ground. Not to try and create and be productive and make money and all these things that we do. So that we would remember that really it's not all dependent upon us. And all through the Bible you find God saying, look, if you take the seventh day off, I will provide enough for you. Now think about it. We live in a culture where there's things called workaholics, right? Like we, we don't know how to stop working, right? Now why do we not know how to stop working? Well, I think there's a couple reasons. If you read the creation account and you read the fall of Adam and Eve... God, when he cursed Adam, he cursed Adam's work. And really what God did, in effect, was Adam developed an inappropriate relationship with his job. Because instead of everything being there for him, now Adam had to work by the sweat of his brow. See, and so what happens is, is that we begin to believe that everything we do, if we don't do it, it's not going to happen. And really what you're saying is, it's all dependent upon me which, my friends, is functional atheism. Although we may believe in God, we may live like we really don't. So God placed us out every single week. There had to be a day where no work was done. And I love what the Lord does here, because not only does it say, you shall do no work. Notice, verse 13, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day, it is the Sabbath of the Lord. That word Sabbath literally means rest. It's the rest of the Lord. Your God. Now, in it, in it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor any of your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well. Now, I love that. Because God knows the heart of humans. Because you might be like, well, I can't work, and I really don't trust God, so I'm going to make someone else do the job. Right? So you set up your cattle, you put a little carrot in front of the cattle, and you make the cattle do all the work on the day it's supposed to rest. It's a rest for everybody. Why? Because it's teaching us that the world does not need us to continue on. It puts us in our proper place of humanness as the people who are created as opposed to the creator. And each one of us need to learn to work hard, but realize that whatever production we get out of our lives, it's really dependent upon the Lord. And so much of the life of the children of Israel, and I believe by extension our lives, is a relearning of this reality. I realize that many of us right now, you hear me say this and you're thinking, I totally live like it's all dependent upon me. I feel like if I don't do it, it's never going to get done. And I don't know how to stop because I'm totally freaked out that it's not going to happen unless I do it. And I'm here to tell you, my friends, this is why God instituted the Sabbath day. Now, you might be saying, okay, so Fusco, God instituted the Sabbath day, so am I supposed to take a Sabbath day? Now, here's the thing. According to the book of Hebrews, Jesus himself is our Sabbath rest. Very important. Read about in Hebrews chapter 4 that it's not about observing a day. It's about realizing that in Jesus, you and I cease from our labors. We get off of the hamster wheel of trying to work our way into heaven. Because isn't that the message of the Apostle Paul in almost all of his letters? Right? The message is this. The message is that left up to your own devices, you're going to think that God loves you more or less based on if you prayed, if you served, if you gave, if you didn't drink, smoke, or whatever your struggles are. And if I don't do, if I don't do those things, God will really love me. But if I do do those things, then God doesn't love me. And guess what? That's not the gospel. The good news of Jesus is not that God is a conditional friend. That if you do the things they want you to do, then they're your friend. And if you don't, then they're not your friend anymore. That's not who God is. See, God loves you because God is love. 
And when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, even when you fail, it's not that God loves you less. His heart just breaks for you because you're wallowing in the mire when you shouldn't be. So when we realize that God can't love us more and won't love us less, it stops a cycle of living constantly feeling, I'm not good enough for God. I messed up for God. I didn't do it. God doesn't love me. And I think for many of us right now, no matter how long you've been in church, don't we all struggle with that a little bit? There's some of you right now who are hearing this thinking, I can't think, I can't believe that God would really love me still. Yeah, he's love. Because God is love, God loves you. Not because you're lovable. Not because you had a good day. Not because everything went right and you didn't lose your temper when you were driving down the highway. But for a lot of us, like I was, God really, you feel far from God when you get things wrong But really, if you're born again, the Spirit of God dwells in you and he never leaves. So the idea of rest is important. Have you found rest from your labors? Your self-salvation plan? That's what God wants us to find in Christ. So the true Sabbath rest is Jesus himself. Now at the same time, because Jesus is our Sabbath rest, God still wants you to have a good rhythm of life. Now, I don't mean like rhythm of life, like I like the blues, it's got that kind of rhythm, or I like reggae, and that's got that kind of rhythm, or I like good old-fashioned rock and roll, and so I like that kind of rhythm. The idea is that your life is meant to have a rhythm of vocation and rest, work and rest. And we live in a culture that it's all about productivity. If you can produce, you will keep the job. If you will not produce, you won't keep the job. And the key for you and I, because we live in that kind of a world, is to say, do I have a rhythm of working and resting? And I really believe that for each one of us, we need to learn how to rest. For most of us. Some of us are just lazy and you need to learn how to work. Right? So... Let's just put that out there. If you're lazy, you need to learn how to work. But most of us, we're so busy working that we don't know how to rest. And you wonder why your health is breaking down and your relationships are breaking down and you, you feel frayed and you got ulcers and all stuff. When was the last time you took a day off? Now, the American way is this. I work like a maniac and then on the weekends, I work harder and I need like a vacation from my vacation. Right? Like, I, I love it. I'll meet a guy and he's just like, man, I'm so stressed. I got ulcers and I'm losing my hair and all this stuff's going on. And I'm like, well, so what'd you do this week? And he's like, well, I fixed the deck and I mowed the lawn and, and I built a boat and I did all this stuff. It's like, well, did you take a nap? Did you talk to your spouse? Uh, uh no. It's like, so we live in that kind of a world where we don't know how to stop. See, God designed the Sabbath day, the concept of Sabbath, to be a day out of time, so to speak. A day where you seek the Lord, where you place the priority where the priority needs to be, and that is in your relationship with God and in your relationship with other people. There needs to be one day where you're not working to produce or to gain, a day that is a day of refreshment and building up. And and I, I say this not as someone like, I don't Sabbath real well. You can ask my wife. It's hard to turn off all that's going on. So in some ways, when I share this with you, I'm sharing it with myself as well. Because it's hard to stop and turn off all that God's doing at Crossroads. And how do we do this? And I have my Sabbath thing. I'm dreaming about all this stuff. And it's like, okay, just breathe. Read your Bible. Talk to Lynn. Talk to, play with your kids. Don't worry about it. But that's what the Sabbath day is meant to be. It's a day to work on your spiritual life, to work on being refreshed, your your physical body. Now, if you think about it in kind of biological terms, now again, we all know I'm not like a, a, a workout kind of a guy that much, but if, for those of you who do do that, you realize that what's the best thing for building muscle? After you work out, what do you do? The rest day, that's right. Why? Because on the rest day, after you do all that working out and you tear all those muscles, the rest day is the day that your body rebuilds stronger so that you can go work out the next day. So even within our body, you have this reality. Now, you know, and all through your Bible, you have things like the land Sabbath, where you're supposed to leave land fallow. What's amazing is I, I'm not a, a, an agriculturalist or a, or a farmer, but what I do know is that at a 
science will tell you that you, at a certain point, you leave a, a garden fallow so that the soil can be rejuvenated and refreshed so that it have more nutrients. And so people will rotate their fields for this very reason. All this comes right out of the Bible. Because there is a time that you need for refreshment and rest for your relationship with God and for your relationship with other people. So the key for you and for me is, one, finding our rest in Jesus. Have you gotten off of that hamster wheel of trying to work your way into God's good graces or somebody else's? You rest in Jesus. You find your rest in him, right? And then also, do you have a good rhythm of life where you have times of refreshment and restoration. And if you're one of those people like me who struggles with that, you need to be intentional about it. You need to be disciplined with it. You need to force yourself to enter into the rest that God has for you. And what I've learned with Sabbathing, with taking times of rest, is that it's actually the healthiest thing for me and for my family and for my walk with the Lord. So I pass along. It doesn't come naturally to me, but... I pass it along to you because it's in the Ten Commandments. Now, I love when people say to me, because someone's always bound to say, if you ever meet somebody who says, you know, I'm a good person, I keep the Ten Commandments. The Fourth Commandment is your friend in that moment. Because you say, oh, really? You've kept all ten? Yeah. Tell me about your Sabbath day. And they look at you like this. Huh? It's like, yeah, so you take a day off every week. Don't do any work. You don't make anyone work for you. <laughs> yeah, never happens, not in 21st century America. Anyway, moving on, that's the fourth commandment. The fifth commandment in verse 16, honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you that your days may be long and that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Now, this is very important because now we start moving out of the vertical reality into the horizontal reality. And it begins with this idea of honoring your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you. Now, the Apostle Paul picks this up in Ephesians chapter 6 as well. Now, you have to realize this. The family is God's ordained primary unit of discipleship for people. The family unit, a husband, a male, and a wife, a female, and the fruit of that union, children, is God's primary way of society. That's the, now, you realize we live in a day and age where that is kind of, people don't believe that anymore, but the people who don't believe it in the society we live in, look at what we have going on in our society. Is 21st century Western culture healthy on any level? No. So the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. You know, and I'm not knocking, I'm just saying, people can believe whatever they want about family, but look at what's going on in the world that we live in today. And the disintegration of a family and the full-on onslaught to family that we're seeing it's having its repercussions all through society. Now, notice, it's children honoring your parents. Now, how many have ever seen the TV show Nanny 911? Yeah. Right? You know why that show is in there? Why people do? Because people don't read the Bible. See, parents are not meant to be your kids' friends. You're meant to be their parents. And... Kids should learn how to honor their parents because if children cannot honor their parents whom they can see, how will they ever learn to honor God who they cannot? Now, I say this and I realize, you know what the problem is with children honoring your parents? Is when you have a set of parents who don't honor the Lord and you're lousy parents. And when a parent doesn't take care of their job, then the children say, why would I want to do that? And if God wants me to honor those people, they are loco. Right? And when that happens, then everything starts to break down. Now, here's the thing. If you're a parent, are you a godly parent? Are you a parent who reflects the heart of God to your children? Are you patient and kind, not self-seeking? You know, all, just read 1 Corinthians 13 and apply it to your parenting. Nasty, right? 
That's, you want to go to parenting class, take 1 Corinthians 13 and then take the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5 and say, is this the way that I parent? And know what every parent's going to say? I got work to do. And Jesus said, amen, let's work on it together. Right? So the idea here is that parents are meant to be the stand-ins, the, the physical hands and heart of God in the life of their children. Now the thing is, is except for Jesus, every one of us, I mean, except for if Jesus was your parent, every one of us has been raised by dysfunctional parents. There's no such thing as a perfect parent. There's only a perfect Savior and imperfect people. Now, so as a parent, you and I need to do our best to be good representations of Jesus in the lives of our children. Now, you might be saying, so, okay, so, Fusco, you're freaking me out because I did a lousy job, right? Know what you should do? You should go to your children and apologize. Because guess what? They already know that you've messed up. They're living proof of your messing up, right? They, they get that, but when you come to them as a godly parent and say, you know what? I'm so sorry I lost my temper. I haven't been a great example. You know, sometimes I get frustrated, I get angry, all this stuff. And you say, you know, will you pray for me? God's working on me. That's a very healthy thing for a parent to do. My kids are so used to me saying that that they, I don't even have to finish the sentence. Something will go on, and I'll be like, Obadiah, I'm so sorry, buddy. I got impatient with you. He's like, I know, Dad. God's still working on you. <laughs> and then I say, say, in Obadiah's time, I'm like, Obadiah, we pray for me? And he puts his hand on my shoulder and says, Lord, we bless my dad, and you're working on him, and I'm grateful you are, <laughs> you know? And just keep working on him, Lord, and he, if you want, Lord, let him give me my Minecraft game back. You know, he like slips in a little, because... I realize that as a father and Lynn as a mother of our children, that when they think of who God is, they're going to think of how we showed them who God was and who we are. And so we have a responsibility as parents not to just expect blind obedience, but to honor the Lord. But then as children of parents, then we should honor our parents. Now, I always say that when you depending on where you are as a child depends on how you honor your parents. So, here's the thing. If you live in your parents' house and they pay your bills, then there's one way that you honor your parents because you live in their house and they pay your bills, right? Now, if you're one of those people who are like 40 and living in your parents' house and they're paying your bills, you need to move out, okay? Because that's just sad. I'm, I'm, I'm being, I'm not... I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just being honest. Like, you're supposed to pay your own bills. That's part of life. And I realize sometimes there's circumstances and things that go on. But, like, if you're in there for, if you're in your parents' house, you need to leave your parents' house very quickly. Right? You need to take care of that because that's part of growing up. But if you're, like, I had someone come to me and say, look, I'm 30 and I'm living in my parents' house. Should I honor them? I'm an adult. I'm like, well, you're not an adult if you're not paying your own bills. You're just a big grown-up kid. So pay your own bills, and then you can ask for your rights. But it's like, people get upset. I'm 30 years old. My parents gave me a curfew. I'm like, well, if they're paying your bills, they're allowed to, they want to go to sleep. They, you need a curfew, because you're acting like a child. And so if you are an adult who's living in your parents' house, grow up and move out. They'll be happy you did, trust me. <laughs> right? And so as long as you're living in your parents' house, you are under their roof, and you are, you have to abide by their rules. Even if you don't agree with it, you have to abide by their rules because you're living in their house and they're paying the bills and you honor them that way. Now, at the point when you move out of your parents' house, the point when you move out of your parents' house, then you still honor your parents but in a different way because they're still your parents. And whether or not you agreed with all of it, they did pay the bills for a good long time and they, that should be championed. I mean, wouldn't you like them to keep paying your bills right now? Yeah, most adults would be like, yeah, I'd love it about all my bills paid by my parents, though, and all your meals cooked and all your laundry done. Like, it sounds like a cushy gig. So you spend the rest of your life honoring them, but honoring them as your parents for all that they've done for you and, and God's given place that you've given them, that he's given them in your life, but also you honor them by living your own way. So like one of the things that I learned, I remember when I graduated college and I moved out of my my, my father's house because my mother had passed away. And God started to teach me because I came to know Jesus what it was like to honor my father. So one of the things that I, God convicted me of is that I shouldn't argue with my father because he was my dad. And I'm all Italian, he's all Italian, so arguing is kind of like a love language. And so, 
And I realized it was unhealthy, and so I just made a commitment. I wasn't going to argue with my father anymore. So I stopped arguing with him, you know, and sometimes it was really hard, and I had, we'd talk on the phone, and I'd have to pull the phone away and grip my teeth and, you know, and, you know, jam pens into the desk and all sorts of stuff. So I didn't fight with them because God's working on me and I'm not perfect. But then at the same time, as I've gotten older, what I've learned is that one of the ways that I honor my father is to invite him into my life as an advisor, but also tell him, Dad, thank you so much for your insight and your ideas, but I'm going to do something different. And what's been really amazing now as a a 40-year-old man and 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 as a parent and a husband, my dad always says to me, he's like, he's like, you... You always ask my advice, and you almost never do what I tell you to do, you know? And I'm like, well, Dad, I, I really appreciate your approach. You're my dad, and, and you you've did an extraordinary job of taking care of us, and, you know, we're still close, and so I want to know what your insight is. I'm like, but, Dad, I have to honor God, and I have to honor uh, the life that God has placed in front of me. But my dad always says to me, he says, you know, but, Daniel, thanks for asking. And, and so you find these ways to honor them as your parents, but you're your own adult. A man shall leave his father and mother, and... And, and cleave to his wife, and the two will become one for us. So you start a new family, but even in your new family, you still seek to honor your families of origin. And so this idea of honoring your father and mother, it says in here, and the Apostle Paul calls this the first commandment with promise, because notice what it says. It says, that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. So be, when, a family, when a family is strong, it will bring health to society. And one of the greatest tragedies that we have in our contemporary culture is not only within a nuclear family, but within an extended family, there's so much fracturing, right? And it's creating a society that has divisions and fractures. And I think for those of us who are here, which I believe are many of you, or who are listening to this online or on the radio or on television or wherever you're hearing this, Jesus did exhort us to be peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. And so as much as is within us, we should seek to be peacemakers within our family. You say, I, Fusco, you can say that. You don't know my family. Listen, Jesus died on a cross to make peace for us. And then he invites each one of us to deny ourselves and to take up our crosses and follow him. And I think for many of us, I realize that the wounds of family are the most sensitive wounds. I realize that. But God wants us to deny ourselves, to take up our cross and follow him. And as much as we can, seek to be peacemakers within our family. It doesn't, being a peacemaker doesn't mean you have to take all the blame for everything. But you can say, listen, I'm so sorry for my part of why our family is fractured. And I believe, as I was going back over these notes today, I, it was just really on my heart that I needed to share that. I think for some of you, you need to, even right now, pull out your phones and text the family member and say, I'm so sorry for my part in our relational struggles. Because Jesus made peace with us proactively. We weren't willing parties in the beginning. He proactively made peace. And because the family is God's primary discipling unit, God's primary building block of a healthy society, then as followers of the true and living God, we need to make a commitment to that. Now, I realize for many of you, you there's brokenness, broken marriages, broken families, and you can't go back and redo yesterday. For yesterday, we received God's grace. But we go forward in a new and a different way, and we seek to do differently. I realize family is extraordinarily messy. I mean, I come from an all-Italian family. I mean, my family is just like, ooh. It's like a beautiful mess. I mean, how many of you ever saw my big, fat Greek wedding? You ever see that? You just take away the bunt cake and all of the Greek things. You make it Italian. That's my family. Loud and in your face. And it's it crazy stuff. Kind of, sm I always say like smothering kind of love. It's terrifying. <laughs> like loud love. Like almost obnoxious love. 
You know, and it's like, and so I realized family can be really messy. When you have a loud, smothering family, when something goes wrong, it's loud and smothering, wrong, messed up family. You know? So I realized that family is challenging, but God ordained the family. He ordained the family. And just because maybe you came from a busted family doesn't mean that you need to continue the cycle either. See, that's what, that's what the gospel does. It says that was your history, but it doesn't have to be your future. But we have to say, Lord, I want you to teach me a more excellent way. Lord, I want you to lead me to live differently, to be different. I realize for some of you, your family is broken not because of your choices, but because of the choices of maybe a spouse or a child. And I want to encourage you, if that's you, to say, Lord, I can't control what someone else does, but Lord, give me an open heart that I may continue to go forward in such a way that reflects your glory, that I wouldn't be, become hard-hearted or calloused. Because isn't that what happens when somebody, when a broken family is imposed on us from someone else. It's so easy to get hard-hearted and put up walls, which God wants to tear down. He wants to bring those things down by his spirit. So God ordained the family, and the health of society is tied up in the health of the family. Now in verse 17, you shall not murder. You shall not Murder And the word murder in the Hebrew literally means the idea of with, with malice aforethought. The idea is really premeditated murder. Okay? And so one of the things that in regards to personal property, each person has the right to life because God loves life. God loves life. And I think for each one of us, the idea of Life and cherishing life and working for life is important. And I think it's really interesting because I think we live in a day and age where we're so used to death that we've become cold to how outside of God's plan the taking of life is. I mean, we watch movies and TV shows that are so full of death. We, we see these images on the television and on the internet so often of lives being taken and lost that we've become desensitized to the fact that God created all of humanity to live forever. And when Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the loss of life was ushered in to the human system, but it's never right. That's why you ever notice when, if somebody passes away, even at an old age, it always leaves you feeling like it's wrong because it is wrong. It wasn't God's plan. And so we need to cherish life. We need to cherish it. Life is fragile. Now, you realize that in Matthew chapter 5 that Jesus gets to the heart of this commandment by saying that if you hate somebody, it's as if you've murdered them in your heart. And I love that about Jesus because Jesus realizes that before murder will happen, hatred is festering and fostered in a human heart. Every time somebody commits murder, it began in their heart long before it began in action. It's a heart issue that plays itself out. And Jesus is challenging with these teachings because we say we should cherish life, but really what the work that you and I have to do is let the Spirit of God do a work of us alleviating hatred in our hearts. Like we have it going on in our society right now with, um, with ISIS and with, we had this recent tragedy in San Bernardino where a Muslim couple, and now there's this rise in hatred against Muslims, which is just as bad as what they're doing by killing people. Don't get me wrong, there's a difference of severity. I always had much rather you hate me than kill me, you know? <laughs> there's a difference in severity. But in God's economy, the reason people are murderous is because they hate first. I was reading about the, the young man who went on a killing spree in Oregon in Roseburg. And he told people that 
he wants to be welcomed in hell. He's doing this because he hates people and his life isn't what he wanted. And so he went into the community college there and started shooting people. See, it begins in the heart long before somebody ever picks up some sort of a weapon. Cain killed Abel with a rock. See, the problem isn't the weapon. The problem is the heart that wields the weapon. And I think for each one of us, when we hear you shall not murder and Jesus ties it to hatred, the next question has to be, well, who do I harbor hatred for? And then we hear Jesus saying, listen, you're guilty of murder in your heart by hating them. And that's a terrifying thing, isn't it? Because for, I can't say everybody, because there's always someone who says, I'm the only one who doesn't, you know? But it's very easy to harbor hatred for people. Someone who's hurt us, somebody who's wronged us. Maybe it's a stereotype of a group of people, whether it's an ethnic group of people or somebody of a certain sexual persuasion or religious persuasion or somebody who votes for the other color on the other side of the aisle. Our world is so full of hatred. It, it, it breaks my heart sometimes when I watch. You know, it's like you, you read comments on news articles and it's so awful the way people talk to each other. You know, people don't agree and they just jump on, like, and listen, some of us do that stuff. It's like, that's a murderous heart. And it's completely antithetical to Jesus giving up his life so that we might share life with other people. See, God wants to change our hearts. And when I, see, when I search my heart, there's all sorts of mess in there. And that's exactly why Jesus came. And that's why Jesus lived a perfect life. And that's, Jesus died on a cross because my heart's a mess. To forgive me for that and to forgive you for that. And so if you're hearing this and you're saying, man, I do have hatred for this and that. Come, let Jesus do a healing work. See, for all of us, we feel justified in our hatred. You don't know what they did. You don't know what they did. I'm here to tell you, you're right, I don't know. But Jesus does know. And when Jesus died on that cross, he became intimately acquainted with what they did. That if that person would say yes to Jesus, he would wash them white as snow for what they did. So you're right, I don't know. But the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords does know. So we need to ask God to do a healing work in our hearts in regards to murder and hatred. As I, as I invite the worship team to come on up as we close this out, what would it look like if the people of God received a heart transplant and we walked out the heart of flesh that God has given us. See, I realize I said that, what if it would happen with you all knowing that it's already happened in Christ. Isn't that the new covenant? That God takes out our hard hearts and gives us a heart of flesh, a heart that feels, a heart that's soft again. What if instead of hating somebody who has hurt you, what if you begin to think to yourself, I wonder who hurt them that they would do that, and maybe I should pray for their healing. What would it look like in each one of our lives is if instead of hating people, we began to love didn't Jesus say we should love our enemies and we should pray for those people who hurt us? See, Jesus' way is so challenging to us because we want to hate people. We just had someone, they were very upset because it's like, well, Fusco thinks we should just love terrorists and just going to let them into the country. Because that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying we should be naive to what goes on in the world, but if Jesus said love your enemies, I, if that makes me an idiot, I can be good with that. I'll be good with being an idiot for lining up with Jesus. But how? how? You're saying, but how, how do you find love? 
Well, you pray. And you say, God, your word tells me to love my enemies, and I don't know how to. Can you show me how? And you know what God does? He brings you and I to the cross where God loved his enemies, you and I. We were rebels. We were, we were rebelling against God's godhoodness. And he said, I'm gonna take the punishment that you deserve because I love you. See, the gospel makes no sense. Except when you realize that God's way of making no sense makes total sense. And my hope and prayer as we come to the Lord's table in just a moment and as we respond to the Lord in worship, that if you find hatred in your heart for a person, for a a group of people, for a situation, that you would say, Lord, I am aware of the hatred in my heart. And Lord, your word says, if there's any wicked way in me, lead me in the way of everlasting. And you simply say, Lord, change my heart. Do a work in my heart. Lord, you know the reasons that there's hatred there. You know the hurts that are associated. You know all the stuff. And I'm here to tell you, yeah, no human can do it. I can't do it. But God is the great physician. God is the ultimate heart surgeon. God can take the hatred out of our hearts and put his love there. And that's exactly what he wants to do if we'll let him. That doesn't mean we're going to let people who are vengeful and hurtful. It doesn't mean we're going to let them hurt us. I'm actually far from it. One of the ways that you love your enemy is by not letting them hurt you. Those boundaries are very, very real in the heart of God. It's not some sort of naive become a doormat. It's us not returning evil for evil, but returning good for evil. And isn't that the plans and the purposes of God for his people? How different would your life look if it wasn't ruled by hatred? How different would you treat people if you didn't treat them based on what they deserved, but by how God sees them? I'm here to tell you, following Jesus and believing in Jesus is the narrow gate. It's a difficult way. Few find it, but it leads to life. And my prayer is that for each one of us, we would believe in Jesus and we would enter by the narrow gate. We would take that difficult way. And who cares if nobody else has found it? It leads to life, not death. Amen.